Hello and welcome to the Echo Chamber podcast. My name is Tony Groves and today we're checking our eligibility for how content we're allowed to be. Uh, as always, I'm joined by my co-host and the man is only happy when he's miserable, Martin McMahon. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> uh, but much more importantly, we're delighted to be joined in the tortoise shack by the Prevention Officer in Clondalkin Drug and Alcohol Task Force. A very busy mammy. Drummer, she tells me. She tells me about her. She has a passion for drumming. Uh, Social Democrat re- representative, Dublin South Central, Tara DC. Tara, you, uh, I just read to you downstairs, and I won't tell you who said it, but he said possibly going to be the best politician <laughs> of her age. So that's really now. We'll start from there. I wouldn't set the bar so low. Um, <laughs> Thanks, lads, for having me. It's great to be here. God, yeah. I'd love someone who actually said that. I must slip a crisp 20 into his back pocket. We'll let, we'll <laughs> <laughs> I, I, might, I might share it later. Um, but, but no, seriously, thanks for coming across. And I will um, jump straight in with why I said the eligibility for being content, because that was a great phrase that, that was in a little video you guys did out in uh, the Clondalk and Bulgari area. Yeah. And uh, it, it it hit me. I, I really, I, I I tweeted it out already. We'll, we put it out with the podcast. Have a look at it, guys, because it actually just shows you the systemic treatment of what we thought, what we would say to people who now are deemed not important enough to be mm-hmm. treated with dignity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I suppose just to give you a bit of background to it, um, we carried out a piece of research a couple of years ago looking at the relationship between drug use and social exclusion and how people felt they were being treated. Um And I suppose there was a lot of negative stuff came up and a lot of people were feeling very disenfranchised and a lot of people were kind of feeling very left behind. And in fairness, they they were being left behind. And considering we have, um, you know, quite a number of well-known TDs in in that area, you think that things would be kind of slightly different. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Grace Days, the theatre club and and, and, uh, Shane. We did a piece of work with them then talking to community members talking to representatives from the community and also talking to um drug services and the teams that work with within the drug services and they really captured really well like they're a really talented team and theater club do an awful lot of really good work but they really captured where people were at and particularly around the community and voluntary sector they really captured how people were feeling and how they were feeling left behind and also that you know unfortunately they're being treated very poorly um, and the government seems to have turned a blind eye and is very much in denial. And I know Tony, you and me talked about this the other day, this whole idea of, sure, we're in recovery now, we're doing great mm. and everyone is mighty and sure, you know, we should all be quite happy. Um, and I know you mentioned I'm, I'm involved in the Social Democrats as well. Um, and we talk a lot about the locked out generation. And there's a huge number of, of young people, um, you know, that will never be able to afford to buy a house, will never maybe be able to access education, will never be able to start a family because, you know, they, it, it's, I suppose, too late for them because they've been trying to get all the other stuff happening. But there's also a generation who are, you know, beyond locked out, you mm. know, whatever chance, uh, you know, this generation have of getting those things eventually and attaining them. There's another generation who will never get on the ladder. And it's because of the structural damage and it's because of the decisions that have been made by neoliberalism and by the government that we have at the moment. And it's slowly but surely destroying communities. And that community fabric is, is really being destroyed as well, which I think is the crux of it all. And it's, I mean, even we were talking yesterday to Dean and Dean was talking about Ballymun. <coughs> they had spent a billion in Ballymun um, to redevelop it. And yet there is no place for anybody to sit down and have a cup of tea and a chin whack. So that's the sense of community that's been torn out of places. Mm-hmm. And people are isolated in their mm. communities. You were telling us mm. um, there's an atmosphere of fear and people are reluctant to answer doors. Mm-hmm. They're careful. Um that's again part of this structural violence and absolutely it is, right. it is structural violence mm. now Martin, i'll put it to you both this way right you have a problem okay and most of us who may have gone through difficult periods in our life or um you know have issues around housing or whatever you know how you can fix that martin mm. and you know how you can fix it tony right mm. how would you feel if a guy in a suit that works up in a very gorgeous office on, you know, um, Ballsbridge or wherever, will give you that solution without having had a conversation with yourself. Yeah. So that kind of top down stuff has nearly gone full circle. Mm. A couple of years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, we had some chance. We had, 
you know, good community development projects, well resourced family resource centres. We had communities coming together in, in a place that was safe that they could actually say, OK, we need this, we need that, we need the other. If we work together, if we collaborate, we mm. can achieve a huge amount. Nowadays, you're kind of told this is the solution. Suck it up. Yeah. It'll be fine if you just keep quiet. And as the, as the film said, take your pencils and there'll be no more questions asked. And, and we talked about this before we started. If you do get any way leery or, you know, stern or strong, you're emotional. And now we can't work with you now because, you know, you need to kind of calm down yeah. a little bit. So if you speak like you are from a working class community, then you are offended. Well, if you will stop now, yeah, well, zip it up like, you yeah. know, yeah, absolutely. And you can't have, I mean, what we're looking at is, is communities that are being disenfranchised. That, uh, they feel like they're not being listened to and they're actually being told, no, you fit, here's the profile of what, what your community is. Here's the box of solutions we, we offer you. Uh, don't come and ask us for a toolkit. We, we've already put it out to you. We see it more and more now, particularly with these new concrete jungles that are being built still. Um, where, uh, you know, the, the, you see even, even in the, even in the, the grand scheme of the, if where they're developing things like Adams Town, even the back of swords where we have, you know, Applewood went up a few years ago with these things. At least some of them had, you know, uh, a gym or a, or a playground or a park. Mm. These things are, are falling by the wayside because, <clears throat> because we're now in this thing of, oh, well, we just have to fit in as many units. We, yeah. we were lucky to have Orla Hegarty here and she, she said, oh, I'm not going to talk about housing units. I would like to talk about homes. And I think that's what you mean when you say communities, because if mm. you're in a community, you, you feel at home. Mm. I think you're right, Tony. And it's it's funny, a really good friend of mine, a girl I've grown up with um, uh, from Mayo, she's a planner down in Limerick. Um, and she thinks exactly the same way as we think, you know, mm. and she has gone to battle with, you know, um, her, her colleagues and TDs and local councillors in Limerick around particular things. And I think there are some incredibly bright, really brilliant minds in planning and making some of these decisions, trying to make some of these decisions. But the system is, is blocking them and screwing that up. You well, know, we're, we're now at a crux point <coughs> where they, they must build 40,000 houses in the very short term. Yeah. And um, it's going to come to that crux point. We've had a decade and more to plan it properly, mm -hmm. to do it properly so that it's, you're building communities and they just basically blew it all off. So now you're in a situation where they must build, it's going to be greenfield sites and they are just mm -hmm. going to lash units up. No services, no infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much, and dare I say it, like Adamstown, without the train going into Adamstown, Adamstown would be lost. Yeah, but and, and you know what? The, it, it, uh, it frustrates me because, you know, we've done it before, we've had to pull them down, it costs us millions, and, and now we're doing it exactly the same way again. Like we've seen regeneration and I'm in, I'm involved in a, a group with a, a group of, uh, women around, uh, regeneration. And particularly there was a, a collective action brought to Europe around the state of housing. Um, and Balgadi was included in that, uh, Rialto. There was a number of, of, of other areas and there's a group of us come together. Um, because it, in October, it'd be a year to the date and, and very little action has happened. Like Europe have basically said to the lads, get, get your, you know, Get things sorted here. This is not good. And, and nothing has happened. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot of lobbying and trying to make sure that something does happen and, and we do get some improvements. But the long term vision, nobody ever seems to be talking about long term stuff. Well, they did. They came out with, with, uh, uh 2040. 2040. Yeah. But, but it, it, it was big on hype and very, very slim on details. Yeah. And areas like <clears throat> Clondalk, and it was more an economic plan than a than a community plan. Mm. It was about businesses, where do, where which cities will get developed. You know, the places like Clondalk and places like Tala don't get a look in on these things. They mm. don't. And further afield, as you're saying, outside outside of Dublin, there are places, there are villages where there is a a very clear divide, and they'll never get any help either. No, and Martin, it's interesting, like. We have the stats. We, we know, like, and, and, and again, I was, I mentioned it to you earlier, but I looked at the stats specifically for, um, Balgadi and some of the smaller area stats, the CSO, the latest stats. And it's very clear that they have a disproportionate number of adolescents. They have a disproportionate number of lone parents. They have a disproportionate number of people unemployed. The list is, is endless, but there's no service for the adolescents. There, there's, there's nothing for, for children to do. 
there's absolutely zero support for families on, on, in terms of lone parents or, and that whole area, looking at it all together, like, if we don't actually pump some kind of resources into it now, it's going to end up costing so much more to try and fix that. So it's like, you know, we can't look at something on a longer term and say, in terms of cost benefit analysis, this will be worth it if we, we do this right. We, we have this, we have this argument with this, with the state, um, all the time because there is a, there is a fallacy, an economic fallacy that Fine Gael are the steady hand on the tiller. But, but the reality is the most expensive way of housing people is things like HAP. The yeah. most expensive way is emergency accommodation. Whereas you can build a, a three bedroom up the road for 163,000 for the, which would cost less than three years HAP payments or, or the equivalent. So you could actually buy, <laughs> build it from scratch, have it, have it, you know, energy A rated, mm -hmm. a comfortable family home. <laughs> you can build communities that people can live in. But Fine Gael choose to pump it into the private sector, into the private market. <clears throat> Likewise, when it comes to these um, these services where we talk we talk about mental health issues, I mean, we, I, I told you earlier you asked me about the the the, the investigation yeah. on RT last night and how I had to turn it off. <clears throat> um, it's things like that when you realise we're actually just kicking the can down the road for what we'll actually have to what we what what, what we what we sow now we'll reap later and we'll reap reap it in in damage to people who whose children won't get an opportunity to actually have, get a, a proper upbringing and the people now who are you know uh, make well, let's say they make what 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 this the state would say a mistake you know they 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 take drugs or yeah. whatever how do we support them. And that's, and I think, and, and something really struck me with that last night. Uh, if, if you have resources, even if you have resources and you have enough money to access private cancer or whatever, there still isn't, you know, services in place for you to be able to access that. Mm. What if you don't have that money in the first place? Yeah. What are you going to do then? You have absolutely no choice, you know? And even like, and it kind of really struck me last night, whether you have money or you haven't, we're, we're not looking after our young people in any way, shape or form. And if you're a young person that's smoking a bit of blow, you know, having mental health issues or something like that, there are very few places for you to go. There's a lot of places like, um, you know, if you've got dual diagnosis, they, they won't touch you with the barge pole mm. because it's like, oh, which comes first? Is it the drug or, or is it the uh, mental health? Oh, listen, we need to refer you somewhere else. And the other side of that coin, and I've had this experience with mums as well, you know, mums around the same age as myself, their young fella smoking, you know, a bit of cannabis. Um, he might be dabbling with a bit of coke or a bit of ecstasy at the weekend. She's really worried about him. She sees a change in his behaviour. That woman ends up going to, you know, a, a drug service that was traditionally set up for, you know, active heroin users. And yeah. she, mm. that's the support that she, that's the only support that she can actually access. Um, and that's an issue as well. It's well, like. With the, we see with Portugal, they've changed their view on, on how they handle drugs. Yeah. And it, it is paying dividends for them. And their drug use has actually dropped and yeah. crime has dropped. Here we tend to criminalize everything. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, the old trope is cannabis is your gateway drug. Well, no, poverty is your gateway drug. Absolutely. You know, and that's the truth. Absolutely. Of it. Um, at the moment, and we had Dean in yesterday and I've, I've spoken to a few other people recently. There is a crack epidemic going on very quietly in the background at the moment. Very, very quietly going on but you're at the front line of this you see this every day yeah we're actually at the moment um we're doing a joint initiative um with the Anna Liffey project and the Kildare Drugs Task Force because where we're situated in Clondalkin it's it's quite a busy thoroughfare for people coming from down the country right there on the right there on one of the main arteries in and out of Dublin absolutely and we've actually um two really good drug services they do outreach now we we brought together uh, drug services, the, the three, um, drugs task forces, the senior guardy, um, and we've come up with a quite a good pilot and we're going to do an advertising campaign with Irish Rail because they're, they're getting the train up from Limerick, Athlone, all different parts of the country, um, and coming up to score. Um, so we've been doing like outreach. Um, we're going to be doing some training with the Irish Rail lads just in terms of, you know, how to deal with somebody if they're stoned or, or whatever. Um, but it absolutely, it, it's becoming increasingly more of an issue. Um, a, a number of years ago, we, um, got involved in an initiative around crack pipes and actually having a crack pipe exchange and people kind of thought, Jesus Christ, what are you doing? You're handing out crack pipes. You're, you're just, you know, encouraging yeah. use. But again, we found it worked very well because not only was it actually lowering bloodborne virus, you know, in terms of people sharing uh, works and people sharing pipes, 
but it also was maybe the first time that they thought of accessing a service. So yeah. one of the outreach lads had handed them a crack pipe and it might be the first time they say, look, do you want to come up and have a cup of tea? Do you want to start talking about your crack use? Or, you know, is there is there other stuff going on? So it's that first initial kind of, uh, that first initial kind of interaction that really counts. I would agree with you too. I would absolutely agree and support you in terms of decriminalisation. Um, and we're working with Citywide. Citywide have been the lead in this for the last number of years and they do incredible work. Um, Anna Quigley, I'm sure you've probably heard of Anna. She's an incredible um, advocate for decriminalisation. Um, and we would absolutely support that as well. But we're also kind of conscious that there's a bit of confusion between decriminalisation and legalisation. So mm-hmm. we need to open up that conversation because a lot of people say, yeah, well, you, sh- you can't legalise drugs or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and to a certain degree right now in Ireland, I don't think we're ready to legalise drugs. I think decriminalisation of, you know, drug use of, of a small quantity for active drug users, but legalising all drugs, I don't think we're ready to do that yet because we're already drowning in the drugs that we have and we need to have serviced communities a lot better in order for us to do legalization and, and, and i think you hit a great point there because the, the reality is the the trope will be thrown back at you that you know you can't you can't decriminalize it and they'll say the, and the, you know, the u.s oh the war on drugs and yeah. anybody who knows the war on drugs it's been lost decades ago um you need the only way to actually to, to do it is actually to almost bring it out of tr- admit that you've lost the war on drugs and start <laughs> building up support structures as you say, to actually turn people's heads and, and actually say to them, well, look, there's other there's other routes, you know, can we get people, bring them back to uh, find out what was the underlying cause? Where, was there me- mental health issues? What, were they just deprived? Are you in a poor community? These are not, these decisions that people make are not, uh, they're not fatal, nor should the sh- state cho- choose to treat them as fatal. But what we have now at the moment is it's uh, it's it's just very easy to classify someone as a junkie. Absolutely. And, uh, and if you classify someone as a junkie, you've just said they're less than. If they're less than, well, then it doesn't matter that they're only getting. But there is also a class bias in this as well. And that there's drug use is, is right across the board. It doesn't matter what class mm-hmm. you're from. <clears throat> but different types of drugs tend to be used in different areas. Mm-hmm. Where cocaine is quite popular on the, on, you know, in certain sections of the sets and quite acceptable. Um, I think they went into the doll toilets at one stage and did. Uh, t- this is true. They did. Yeah, uh, they did the swipe. Test, they did the swipe the test. For yeah, and yeah. there was traces of cocaine in the doll. Now the public toilets. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying. Where TDs, <laughs> the TDs, TDs, TDs went and sniff up off the back of toilets. You know? <laughs> they need a marble table. So, <laughs> so there is a difference, and it's treated differently. If you're a working class. Or you come from working class communities where you're a drug user, you're stigmatized. If you're, you know, on the south side and you're, you're out somewhere and you're taking a line of coke, that's all very acceptable. It is. And you know, it's funny because I always use, I always use this, this example to try and ex- explain it to, you know, people that mightn't have a, a huge understanding of it. <clears throat> if you're a 15 year old in Balgadi, you start smoking a bit of grass. Then at the weekend, you, you do a couple of lines of coke or whatever. And then all of a sudden, the coke becomes Friday, Saturday, Sunday night instead mm. of just Saturday evening or whatever. And things kind of start to spiral and school suffers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Then you're, and I'm not, I suppose, trying to class it, but we'll say you're a 15-year-old in Ballsbridge. You do exactly the same thing. All of a sudden, you might be sent to Australia to find yourself. Yes. <laughs> yes. To go off and do your, your transition year uh, work experience. Yeah. You're going to be at the best counsellor that the country can provide. You're going to get the brand new little laptop that you wanted. You're going to get everything you will that mom and dad have in their back pocket to make sure that that happens. This kid, on the other hand, might already be struggling at home financially. The school might not be very supportive. And again, I'm, I'm just using this as an example. Yeah. There certainly won't be that trip away to make things, you know, there won't be that bribery. If you don't smoke a joint today, I'll, I'll get you the pair of runners or whatever. And unfortunately, in a, in a lot of those situations, mom might be on her own at home or mom and dad might be at home together. And they're worrying about the mortgage. They're worrying about actually putting food on the table. They're worried about the other three or four little boys and girls that are in the house. How are we going to get the runners? The communion is in May. How are we going to do that? The mould is still falling off the windows. The list is just endless. But you see, there's also an expectation. And it's this is where we're, where we're class and drugs do intersect. There's an expectation from the child in the affluent area that they will actually do well that they will actually go somewhere because they have something to lose if they don't yes 
a lot of kids in the other situation have lost everything and they have nothing less. And there's no, students. they don't have the expectation and nobody has the expectation <laughs> for them. We were, t- when we spoke to Dean yesterday, um, not on mic. So sorry, Dean, but I'm going, I'm going outside, <laughs> outside my remit here. But he was saying that we were taking kids from Ballymun to say Port Marnock, just out to the beach. And he said the kids, he, so he gets to the beach and he sees the, the, the lads that are, you know, from around Port Marnock and Malahide. And they get down to the beach to throw their, they throw their uh, t-shirt down and they go into the, into the sea and they start swimming as if they were, um, Michael Phelps or whatever it is and the way they go. And he says the lads from Ballymoon come out and go, what's the song? What's that? Song? And, then, and, then, and he, cr- and, and they would freeze and he just, he said, because the kid from, from, uh, Malahide or Port Marnock just goes, everything's going to be fine anyway. And grand, this is, I, they have an expectation. I can, we can do this. We're all, this. the other guys just, and we're completely outside of their comfort zone. And he said, he said, and it brings it home to him that, you know, Jesus, uh, what, what, if we're seeing that in these children, what sort of roadblocks are they putting themselves inside, in front of themselves in terms of what they can be? Do, do, do they, do they aspire to anything else? Because mm-hmm. if you can't aspire to being able to bloody swim in the sea, yeah. can you think you're going to grow up to be a doctor or, 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 or the Taoiseach? And the other side of it is, and I think that the film co- captured it quite well, there's still, like, there's such a spirit in mm. Clondalkin. Like, I've been privileged to work in Clondalkin for the last 12 years, and I, I don't know if I could <laughs> find it hard to work somewhere else, because, like, there's real spirit and, you know, and it's also important to remember that, yeah, you know, drug use is an issue, but a very small portion of young people in Clondalkin will become problematic drug users. You know, there's the stuff that's been done in the schools in Clondalkin is phenomenal. Mm. And this is what kind of, you know, gets my goat sometimes. It's like, can you report on the good stuff, please? And I noticed last night, and it really spoke to me last night, RT had a, had a section on uh, Closh de Breed were doing a piece um, around mental health and it was all incorporated into the week. Yeah. But it just said uh, Closh de Breed, Dublin. And I'm like, why would you say Closh de Breed, Clondalkin? Yeah. If that was a drug, something bad, you'd have yeah. said Closh de Breed, Clondalkin. And well, I was just like, well, it, it and does, I knew the school and I was like, why didn't but, you but say they, But they all do that because if there's, if there's, um, do you, the growing up, there was always this, the, the, the trope was, you know, uh, in, in the States, there was trouble on the West side. And, and it, whenever it was trouble in, in Dublin, Tala got referred to just as the West side. <laughs> and, you know, and, and this was, this is what it was all lumped into. So it was, it was always, cause we all, we always, you know, we can, you can, can make the joke about you know Dublin two four as the as the lads like to say about Tala, but but they would but the media will say the West Side, mm. and it's almost like that yeah the Wild West or whatever the connotation is with that. That's what the connotation is. Yeah. That's what it means. It doesn't mean West <coughs> Dublin. It actually means the Wild West, and that's the message oh, they're trying yeah, to get out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, but my point is it's 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 profiling an area. Mm. And, and it's accepted in the media, and they do it all the time. It's always profiling. It is as we were saying. It, the Taoiseach recently said that no matter where he was born, he could have made it to Taoiseach now. He said there's no no prejudice, um, no prejudice holds no sway in, in this state, which is a complete and other we fallacy. All know, we can all mm. honestly say, hand on heart, that a kid that goes to school in Tala, comes up through the, the camp in Tala, their chances of making Taoiseach in this country are virtually Zero. Mm-hmm. Zero. Absolutely. So there is a class divide. I mean, it's easy for Leo to say, oh, I could do this. You can because you are closer to the finish line than the other people. Who, you know, they're miles from the finish line at the start. Absolutely. And I actually I actually don't think this is just an urban issue. I think it's down, you know, a rural issue as well. There, Like access to the type of um, resources that the likes of Leo could get. Like it's not, it's completely unequal, you know. Um, and I think even, you know, I oftentimes think of if you have the resources, if your child is, is struggling with maths in school, you mm. have the resources to pay for grinds. If your child is struggling, maybe you're worried about a diagnosis in terms of maybe being on the spectrum or whatever, you can afford to pay that 500 quid for that. Yeah, you need, yeah, yeah no, you need to pay to, to go private because if you are waiting to get it from the state, you can forget about and, it. And this and is a my child, point. And a child loses two years waiting on this and all of a sudden their education is two years behind and uh and all of a sudden they're going into fourth class or whatever it is in primary school and you're still waiting on a diagnosis there's no special needs assistant yeah. assigned to them because you can't get a diagnosis so you need to come up with that 700 euro so it's a gun to your head because you have to do it for your child absolutely and when we look at things like that it, it brings me to the the idea of that gets less and less traction in this country because we talk about recovery all the time and it's the working poor because we keep getting told that 
these communities have, you know, uh, and I know they have high level. There are higher levels relative to other areas of unemployed people. But we have a state that has more people back at work than at any time in the history of the state. <laughs> so people are working. They're just basically working to cling on, though. Mm. And and in those communities, when you're when you're if you're if you're a busy idiot, you can you haven't got time to look up and realize yeah. that that things can be done differently. Um, but I also think, Johnny, and, and we've had this discussion a number of times um, uh, in the job. But if you have an eighteen-year-old that's going on his third computer course yeah. just to keep, that's not employment. No. You know, and, and, and zero hours and, you know, somebody that's just barely by the skin of their, that's not employment. And I think that's a more like fake news or, you know, however yeah. you want to frame they, it. You can, you can, yeah, no, they absolutely frame it differently. They absolutely do. There's no question that you can hide people in, in the stats. You can pad the stats whatever way you want. But that doesn't even, but that doesn't take into account the fact that the guy who still is, they'll say to you, we don't have zero hour contracts, but they'll say, but you have about a minimum hour contract, you know, mm. so you'll get a minimum <clears> of 10 hours a week and you have to be on call for the other 30. I mean, talk about uh, precarious, yeah. Yeah, you know. But it's it, but we have, we've, we've and not lurched, I think very deliberately been steered into um, a large section of, the, of all communities are living precarious life, precarious housing, precarious jobs, precarious futures, mm-hmm. precarious education. Mm-hmm. And that's actually what they want. They want uh-huh. you constantly on that edge, mm. constantly one step from destitution. Because you see, you have no time then. And, and I know this, I, I don't mean to bring it back to drug services or services within the community and branch sector, but we see that as well with managers. You are left then with no time to think about what's going on around you. Yeah, the bigger picture. So we see managers who should be getting involved in strategic stuff, should be lobbying, mm. should be campaigning, but they're sat at their desk with paperwork after paperwork. A tsunami coming at them. It's constant. It's like, and, and managers would say that to you, it's like, I'd love to go, but I have this report to fill in. Like, you might have to write three reports for two grand. Sorry to go back on it, but Dean put it, how do you put it? He said, he said, he said the, the manager or the person who's there is like a baby sitting in, in a cot and, and all they can see is the mobile that's, that's moving around. But if they moved it around, they'd see how there, there's a whole world out there that they could need to be getting involved in and fixing, but keep the mobile spinning, keep them... Keep Constantly. Them, yeah. and, that, and that's a huge issue, you know, and we see that all the time, that they, they just, they're locked in their office. And it's not, nobody wants to be there. Like, you know, they want to be out doing the strategic stuff, but it's it's very clearly done in a way that... No, well, it's also self-defeating in that we've been here before. We've covered this territory before. We have been through um, drug, drug ec- epidemics in Dublin and all over Ireland. And the, the heroin epidemic never went away. It's still there. It's just better managed than it was. But now we have these... And drugs, you know, drugs these days are way more complicated and way more easy to get than they were 10 years ago 20 years ago absolutely and we don't have and i suppose it, it was it, it's a it's a good thing um but there, there's a flip side to it two years ago it was the d- december two years ago um we got an email to say that um we had two new cases of young men smoking smoking and smoking heroin and that was the first time we had seen that in about 10 years now I oftentimes say there's such a plethora of other stuff on the menu. The lads aren't really that bothered about gear anymore That's because right. they see it as a bit. It's nearly beneath them. It's mm. like I'm not smoking gear, or I'm not going. Yeah. You know, I'm not going down that route. But we also have a huge problem, like with steroids, imaging, yeah. performance enhancing drugs, new psychoactive substances. You can go online now and get a bag of spice posted to you, and it's there in three days or whatever. And I know the guards. The guards only tip the iceberg with it and I suppose in, in areas traditionally where there may not have been drugs I know there's uh, in some of the border counties in Leitrim and Sligo they're seeing a big um, a spice problem at the moment yeah and, and, about an that. issue around yeah. the new psychoactive substances now I oftentimes think in, in areas where traditionally there have been more drugs available that um, young people wouldn't be accessing them but we do know that the new psychoactive substances are being used in Dublin a lot and you know there's been a lot of seizures and stuff like that and I suppose there isn't enough research done in terms of us to be able to know the long term implication of it we have hundreds of years of research on coke we know what coke is going to do mm. we have a good idea what cannabis is going to do but the new synthetic stuff we were a little bit in the dark and we don't know what it's doing to because because you because we, we we were very lucky to have sabina brennan in here and and your brain can be rewired and your brain can be chemically uh, altered and it, and it does not always return to its previous state mm. um but the, and i'm sorry to get flippant about it but this is quite this is just something that occurred to me i've 
been in gyms for years and I remember re- routinely seeing the steroid epidemic on the rise and it, it is it's it's look you can steroids are very very prevalent in most uh in most locker rooms and gyms but I saw I was in one recently and uh and I went to the shower and I could hear the, the rattle of pills, which is a, always a giveaway for the for the steroids that are that are being. And I turned and I said, oh, I realized that, that guy must be the dealer. And he's and he turned around and the other fella handed him the money and he just threw the bottles at him. And he said, I, I ordered two. And I'm looking, going, I'm wondering now because I have a, a little bit of a cursory going, wondering what these guys are taking. And I realized he was taking beta carotene to, to give himself a tan. <laughs> I thought to myself, yeah. okay, yeah. so this is where it's going now. They're, they're actually making themselves orange as well as... Well, at least he was doing it the healthy way. We, yeah. we, we had an issue a couple of years ago with melanotan 1 and melanotan 2. So it's yeah. injectable stuff. Oh, so we actually yeah. skin pop you inject it. And there's, there's research to say that it's cancer causing it. Uh. it. It tans your organs from the inside out and all this kind yeah. of stuff. But it is, it, it is, it's a kind of counter, yeah. are, are nearly... If you're taking steroids, you need to get a tan that's as well. It, yeah. That's it, yeah. I was just yeah. sitting there going, like, oh my God, he's literally throwing two bottles of beta yeah. carotene. Yeah. Just go down to Boots. They're probably on three for two. Oh, that's it. <laughs> uh, but it's funny. I went to the, one of these gyms, um, which will rena- remain nameless, but I went to one of those gyms, you know, one of those weight gyms yeah, for yeah. six months, a couple of years ago. Um, I just said, oh, I'll give this a go. So I went in and there was just beef, beefy people <laughs> everywhere. I was like, oh God. But I could see the younger lads like Martin. chatting. <laughs> I could see the young lads chatting to these big men, like yeah, and yeah. kind of saying, and their voices had had barely broken. They're like, "Well, what would you do? So would mm. you cycle it?" And you know, he was talking about the different mechanisms the, the of stacks, of, yeah, yeah mm. t- how you take steroids. And I was like, "Am I thinking I'd love to ring this man and say, well, you get him out of this gym?'" Oh, I just find <laughs> you know? this right to tell him because steroids make your will drop off. Yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah. That well, we do we do a program about the dangers of steroids. Yeah, we do talk <laughs> about. That's yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's no point in looking like that if you can't use it. You yeah. Know what I mean? <laughs> What is the point? What is the point? You'd be disappointed. <laughs> there's, the a lot, the, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> and yet, and yet, it is. Like, look at him. He's like a giddy child. <laughs> But it's the truth. Oh, and if more fellas knew that, okay, you might have the big muscles, but like, think Ricky down there is just lost. There's no hope for you, man. Oh, God. Um, uh, but uh, look, uh, I'm glad we had a little bit of levity here. But 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 if we could, if we can be serious, it does come back down to the supports and the education and when things go wrong because I keep hearing this awful <clears throat> phrase from people in government and they like to say oh we want to triage things we want to have a wraparound service and all that means to them is two phrases to actually deflect from a question that said what are you doing you know uh, which meant they were doing nothing mm. but they say triage and they say wraparound services you might tell us yeah what are they well, I like? think there's I think it's twofold I know um from a social democrats perspective and I know Roisin, Roisin Shortall was very involved in, and was the chairperson um, in terms of Sloan Care and mm. that whole idea of not having a two-tier system um, and having access to primary health care and, and that is really, really important. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, having something in your community that you can actually touch mm. and be part of, you know. Um, from a community and voluntary sector, from drug services perspective, drug services are literally surviving on a thread, like literally. Um, you've got workers who, you know, a lot of them don't have great terms and conditions and are, are, are doing their damnedest to try and, and, and make sure that they're looking after their clients the best way they can. But it goes back, Martin, to what you said. Drug markets change every kind of 18 months or two years. And a lot of drug services are kind of stuck or paralyzed by the funder because hold on a minute. We funded you now to deal with the heroin issue. Yeah. You change, what's going on? Yeah, and you're yeah. like, well, we've got a crack problem, so we need to. So even that, having to get engaged in that kind of discussion and that kind of negotiation, like that shouldn't be the case. Like drug services should be able to be a little bit more flexible in terms of a local need. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there obviously we need to reinstate the funding that has been cut. That's obviously the first thing that needs to happen. And we need to look at it much more holistically. Mm. And I think as well, I'm lucky in Clondalkin because I've got some incredible schools that I work in and they're, they're very progressive and they want you in the door and they want you talking about it. But I think even schools need to be resourced to keep that kid who's smoking the bit of the bit of grass at the, at the bike yeah, yeah so he doesn't end up like i mean like the, suspending or, or expelling a child from school is, is not actually resolving I an issue it's just compounding up, it this came up very recently on on live line this very issue about kids being being expelled for for smoking a bit of grass and when i 
all those years ago when I took the dinosaur to school. People were being expelled for smoking a bit of grass back mm-hmm. then. So, okay, if all those years have passed, that tactic hasn't worked. So can we please try something else? But like, I often say that to even principals and teachers. I say, like, for, for some kids that you're, you're having in front of you, you might be the only kind of, uh, I suppose... Um, continuous adults like somebody that is there all the time yeah. and like your role is probably more important to them than you'll ever understand but what happens six months in a teenager's life is a lifetime yes. yeah. and like he's doing nothing he's on the street he's kind of messing around man might be gone to work or whatever what do you think is it going to end up happening to that kid he's just going to spiral probably in two or three years he's going to be accessing the local drug service because he spiraled out of control without any support. But I think, to be honest, Tony, I actually think that's probably the crux of it. And I think particularly in their per- particular schools who have higher numbers of kids that are presenting with difficulties, and they need to be given resources to be able to try and make sure that Johnny stays in. And well, that, I mean, when that child pres- or is caught or whatever it is, found a bit of hash in their, in their pocket or whatever it is, instead of just cutting that child off, that's when you should be pouring services into that child. Absolutely. And we do the opposite thing. We say, oh, Let's wash our hands of you. <laughs> uh, off on the streets with you, you'll become a bigger problem for us, a lifetime problem for us, whereas we could solve it right here, right now. Yeah, and I know, and, and the, the, I suppose the positive thing, I know um, a friend of mine, Gary Gannon, he works a lot in schools as well, and Gary would always say, like, you know, there are so many incredible teachers out there, and I've had exactly the same experience. There are so many incredible teachers out there that give it absolutely everything. And unfortunately, for kids like Johnny we're talking about, the resources aren't there for those teachers to be able to do that. And they also have a curriculum. They also have 25, 30 other kids in the class that need to be taught. And I, I oftentimes, because the schools, if I hear another person saying they should be doing that in the schools, why? Yeah. That, are the yeah. school, can, the yeah. schools can't physically but, do everything. But like there are programs from, well, I literally, I know I just flicked at the screen there, but the reason I did is because I wanted to, there's a simple program in, in Chicago that they use, the BAM program, Becoming a Man. Where they, they take uh, disadvantaged communities, mainly uh, people of color, and they go in and they kind of have the, the, the conversation with them, but they kind of incentivize school attendance. Um, they talk about, you know, uh, the creating, challenging the culture and it starts with one little exercise where they give a guy a $10 bill and he puts it in his hand and they say to the next guy, get it off him. <laughs> the other guy immediately puts him in a headlock and starts trying to get, but you can't get someone to open their fist. It's very hard to if, if they're at least evenly matched. And then they stop and they say, well, why didn't you just ask him? Because he was told, the one instruction he was given is, if he asks you, you have to give it to him. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it was about that kind of trying to change mindsets in the school and trying to change the, the, the conflict part. So so if, if a pro- program like that, I think it resulted in something like 60% of kids who had previous offences uh, were two years later, had no more, re- had not reoffended. And over, oh, I think it was a 30% leakage rate. Okay. So 10% fell into the void, but there was huge result resources poured mm. into that and made a huge resort, a huge result for the community. And these things, they exist in other communities. Why don't we adopt them? Why don't we look at them? Yeah. And I think, again, a lot of that comes down to resources, but I, I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Richie Stafford. He works in the drug staff task force in Fingus Cabra and myself and Richie and a number of, of other prevention officers are, are looking at bringing in SHARP and it's an evidence-based program around alcohol. Yeah. Um, and we're looking at rolling that out in, in the schools that we're all based in, in September. Now we do have social personal health education in the schools, SPHE, but mm. again, you know, that needs to be tweaked in particular communities because, you know, um, a particular drug might be big in one community and it's not big in another community. And unfortunately, it does all come down to resources mm. like um, SPHE or social personal health education is compulsory up until third year. But it's not an examinable subject. Mm. So it, there isn't a huge, you know, I it suppose. To, yeah. yeah. Whereas I think those kind of things, it should be an examinable subject. and There'd be a little bit more kind of he put on it and mm. I think people would be a little bit more willing to put additional resources in it and it's it's like the whole mental health issue as well Tony it's like we need to kind of bring it both together in terms of you know why people are using drugs how they feel when they're when they are using drugs how do we get them off them and how do we prevent them from using them in the first place the yeah and it's like and again t- to be honest Martin I actually I, and, and again we have this whole issue even with the drug issue it's like there's no joined up thinking 
Yeah. You know, there are a number of departments that should be coming together very regularly to talk about the drug issue. And we're never going to do anything about the drug issue if we if we stay in an island and, and just leave it to the HSE or leave it to the Department of Health. It's not a Department of Health issue. It's a justice issue. It's an education issue. It's a social welfare issue. It's all of those things put together. But trying to bring senior officials together with money and resources has proven very, very difficult. On that note, on a personal note, how do you... You're very optimistic and you come across as very optimistic. How do you stay going in the face of what we can say are our failures and repeated failures again and again and again? <clears throat> I think, and most people, anybody that's involved in community development would say that the process is the most important part. So you end up, and again, we're, we're doing a piece of work around Balgadi, as I was talking earlier. Um, it's not fast. So, you know, bankers and those kind of people would not enjoy community development work. But small, small positives do happen. And, you know, over a period of time, change does come about. Um, and you can see when that change does come about, the difference that it does make. It is slow. Absolutely, Martin, it's slow. But it does happen. And I'm, I'm even thinking around Balgadi um, and around other projects that we're working with at the moment. I'm absolutely 100% confident that we're going to get a good result because we just keep at it until we do. Well, also, you come across as very capable, very able. When are you going into politics? Um, okay. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that one. Um, yeah. So I'm the general election candidate for Dublin South Central. Okay. Um, so again, I, I think we're at this talk about next February or next March for a general election. I'm well, not 100% it's, it's sure. It's certainly, it's certainly, look, it's, you in, know, it's, it's, in, it's in the mix. They're, they're, the slow bike race is just, wait, the, the bikes are wobbling now. They're starting yes, to totter yes, and yes. We're, uh, they're, 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 they, no one's going to pull the plug. It's, it's probably going to be post budget, but it's on its way. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's the plan. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm very confident there's room for a social democrat in Dublin South Central. I really, I really believe that. Um, I'm really lucky that we have people like Catherine Roisin, our, our co-leaders. We've got incredible candidates. And that kind of, when you talk to other candidate, candidates, like people like Gary Gannon, like, you know, real good people sound good. Gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tony. Tony Does he have a bit of a man yeah, crush? Yeah, big time. Big time. <laughs> um, and look at Carly Bailey, Amory McNally, um, mm. Sarah Jane, uh, Henley down in uh, Limerick, Nile O'Toole in Galway. Like, oh, this, this is this is just the, cool people. We've gone, we're, we're going to hold. Okay, sorry. <laughs> can I just say it? Okay. But no, really good people. But I think I think there is there's definitely a shift. I know for myself getting involved in politics, like you know, I kind of I was him and hawing about it and I thought, no, I think we need to because because I think there's definitely a hunger out there for people. I know there's a generation of people that feel really lost and they feel very apathetic and they're like, oh, not another politician. And I really want to change that because I think, as I say, there's definitely space in Dublin South Central for a social democrat. And I think um, I think we're going to do very well. Well, I could say, definitely say talking to you that you're not just another politician. <laughs> you know, I think we can say that fairly certainly. I, I would go back, though, and especially from the community level. Mm -hmm. And this is where I see it now, and I'm, I'm getting more and more anarchi anarchistic as I get. Yeah, the longer I do this, I bloody, the longer I do this podcast, <laughs> I'm, I, I must be on watch lists everywhere at this stage. But, um, but I do think that the type of, um, direct democracy that you, where, you know, it doesn't just have to be your local TD. Your local TD actually can just be a, a, a can ha help facilitate these things, but we need to have grassroots. We need to give these communities that are disadvantaged. <clears throat> Say, well, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to listen to you. We're going to ask you what, what you need. And we're going to say, well, you know, here's a structure and we'll try and, we'll try and actually filter news up as opposed to just. I agree with you, Tony. I actually think if we gave more power to our local councillors and actually took the parish pump stuff out for our national, our national yeah. politicians and actually said, right, we're going to, we have a higher expectation of the hours and, and that kind of stuff. We're going to give you a better salary. So yeah, that you we'll, can value, actually, we'll value the job. Absolutely, value it. And then actually leave our national politicians to focus on, on national issues. I think that would be a really, really good idea. But I think, um, you know, when we talk about communities participating, we really need to look at that in, in a much greater way. We really need to go back to community development and go back to a time where community development projects were respected, where people actually felt that their voice was being heard, that it was part of a structured um, input and it was part of a bigger plan. And I, I really think we need to go back to that. I, I think unless we go back to that, um, it's not going to be very positive. Well, you know, uh, uh, there was a time when the community informed national politics mm -hmm. and now national politics informs the community. Absolutely. 
So there was a time, and I, I can definitely say it coming back because people get fed up being left out in the loop. Yeah, absolutely they do. Yeah, and they're tired, and I, that kind of was captured in in, in our short film. Mm. People are tired. You yeah, know? fed up. They're tired and fed up, and, and I'm hoping that'll go full circle and that people will actually get out and vote in a general election and in a local election and actually vote with their feet and say, right, we want some change, yeah. let's do it. All the way. I want, yeah, to, I want, all the way. I want to see the end of that. Uh, you know what he keeps saying, uh, these polls lately? They're, so the, the trope is, in the, in the, they have a poll, um, Fine Gael do well in the poll, and we get told, Fine Gael do well in the poll. Sinn Féin do well in the poll, and it's always added with the caveat, well, Sinn Féin never perform in, a, in an election. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so, so everybody who's listening, listen for those ticks. They're the ticks of, of the reportage. What they're actually trying to say to you is, when you get to the when you get to the uh, to the voting booth, just vote Fine Gael fin <laughs> as you always have. <laughs> don't don't dare change your vote. So, are you going to be dictated to by the by that kind of? Do what you always did. Catherine Murphy sat in that chair and she said, the Einstein quote of, if you keep doing it the same thing over and over yeah. and expecting a different result is insanity. Yeah. Um, I thought, you know, that's a perfect, that's a perfect example of what Ireland has done for a hundred years. I do think there's an opportunity for actual change. And the only way you're going to change it is if we make sure we, we do engage the electorate, engage local communities and we go from there. I think what you do on the, what you do on a local level is really really important. But you know you're really at the call face, and I couldn't even I wouldn't even begin to try and do the stuff that you guys do because I have uh, I, I'd be too squeamish. <laughs> well, well I, look, looking forward to this general election. I think you're on the ground. You know a lot of people. You have groundwork that nobody else has put in. Put in. So <laughs> I think you have an advantage there. I think you could give it a good shot. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. I'm and I just to add what you said, Tony. I think. Involving young people in that is really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had our um, national conference down in Cork a couple of months back and a journalist came down from Dublin and he walked into the room and he was like, geez, I've never seen so many young people at a political thing. Okay. And it's like, I think young people are fed up and that mm-hmm. knocked out generation and they're just fed up and they're like, right, let's get involved in a movement. And I see it more so as a movement nearly, you know, mm-hmm. that encourages and invigorates people and say, right, come on, let's get this done. Yeah, no. Well, I think the, the community in Clondalk and owes you thanks for all the work you did because it is thankless work for the main part it's thankless work yeah <laughs> and, you know so the, I know in the it's, it's enjoyable so that's what you get yeah, out of and it and I think that's what I'm amazed of is that you come in with a smile on your face I'd probably be devastated working <laughs> not at all absolutely <laughs> devastated working it's the people that. you work with though it's like you know the, the community you put up and they're well, you incredible. said the women are strong oh really women are strong. just like I just walk away and I'm just like they're just incredible women like just incredible yeah yeah you were saying that to us earlier yeah Mm-hmm. The, the women will inherit the earth. <laughs> <laughs> the right we're going, it's all over, Martin. <laughs> Listen, uh, no, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it's been it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks, folks, for listening. Do hit subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. It, it, it just when you leave a review, it helps other people find us on the other platforms. It gets us up the charts, so it's free advertising. We're not, we don't ask much. Just do that for us, will you? Thanks.